Hello folks, welcome back to English 437, 537. In this lecture we'll be covering the first parts of the books by Martin and Carroll. And there's, you know, these are introductory chapters of course, but I think they get at a lot of the themes that we'll be coming back to. And uh, the reason, really the reasons I picked these books, because I like these big questions. I think it's interesting to approach these things from a philosophical perspective, try to get at the big picture uh, before we start diving into uh, the nitty gritty as it were. And I like to start with this concept of the renegade, uh, renegades and the rules. Uh, Amy Jo Martin talks about how there's really no rules to follow. You know, these new technologies come out all the time, <laughs> whether it's uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok is one that gets brought up all the time recently, TikTok this and TikTok that. <laughs> uh, so the question is, somebody hearing about TikTok, and they want to know, well, what, what is it, and how do I use it, and what's the right way to use it? If you're a company, if you're trying to brand yourself, if you want to establish a presence on this, you know, how do you go about that? Uh, and what Amy Jo Martin uh, points out, quite rightly, I think, is that there's really, most of the time there won't be uh, a solid template. There won't be a solid set of guidelines for you to follow. Instead, you just have to jump in and try to find your own way. And this can be scary for some people, right? Especially, the, I think there are types of folks who do, and I notice this as a professor. If you teach classes, you probably notice this too, about some of your students, uh, they really want everything spelled out, you know, very carefully uh, delineated. You know, what's step one? What's step two? What's step three? Exactly how long does it need to be? And so on and so forth. And they're very uncomfortable with uncertainty. They don't want to hear, well, you know, just write about what you want or make it as long as you feel it needs to be. <laughs> you know, some students, that's fine. Uh, other students, that drives them insane. Uh, so that's, I think, part of the beast here with social media is that unfortunately or fortunately, depending on, again, the, your, your personality type, uh, a lot of this will just be you forging ahead, not really knowing what you're doing at first, trying to establish along the way some kind of strategies that work for you in your particular circumstance with your particular audience. Uh, so I like the concept of the renegade. I mean, there's some subtleties of the term I'm not sure about, so I thought I would bounce this off of you. Uh, so what do you think of Martin's concept of the renegade in terms of social media? Do you think this is a useful way, useful concept, noun, I guess, uh, to think about social media? Why or why not? All right, so moving on then. I'll try to keep these uh, comments brief. We could obviously spend uh, hours and hours on each one of these elements, but we will have time to come back uh, throughout the semester and talk about these. Uh, one of the interesting concepts or dimensions of social media is this idea of ongoing engagement. Uh, so Martin says, ongoing engagement is no small benefit. Once it's established, success depends largely on your ability to keep the conversation going. And then she gives us some ways to uh, try to keep the conversation going, asking the right questions, listening for the most common answers, and then innovating your business accordingly. And so she's talking here about companies that want to move online, establish a social media presence. Uh, a lot of, uh, I think it was, I was at Granite City, uh, and how, I remember being at Granite City last Halloween, and they had this ongoing, they were trying to get a conversation going about uh, costumes. <laughs> uh, they wanted people to go to the restaurant, dress up in their Halloween costumes, and take pictures, and then share the pictures on, I think it was uh, Instagram or Pinterest, or one of those. And it didn't really pan out too well. I think we were, there's only like two people that <laughs> actually put their pictures up. <laughs> Uh, so that, that kind of failed. Uh, so you might go back and look at this and say, well, okay, we're, how were they trying to establish this engagement? Why didn't it work? Uh, so that's just one example. But I could think of being a teacher and how we are often in, not just online, but even in a classroom setting. You know, how do you get the students talking? And, you know, some questions you ask the class and everybody just gets quiet and terrified, right? Because it becomes one of those things where, uh, you're, you're embarrassed if you answer wrongly. And so that's obviously not the right questions to be asking if the purpose is genuinely, if your genuine purpose is to stimulate some conversation, <laughs> you don't want to be uh, putting people on the spot and creating some kind of a 
atmosphere of uh, fear. Um, but, you know, all the way from that, even asking on a survey, as I like to do in these lectures, I think a lot about what are the right questions I can ask. And then when I read the responses, I think, well, okay, this, this, a lot of people are answering the question this way. Uh, so what can I learn from that? How can I tailor my next lecture uh, in a way that's going to accommodate that, you know, be innovative? Uh, so I think that's her main idea here with the ongoing engagement. Uh, I also think about the, uh, the celebrity presences online and how important this is for businesses. And I like to think about, I know some of you are musicians, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my, my engagement with the bands I liked. <laughs> I watched their videos on MTV and I uh, bought their CDs, you know, 20 bucks. That was about it. I might read about them in a magazine every once in a while. Maybe they might go on a, a, a night talk show. You know, that's about it. Uh, whereas now that's, that's, that would be, uh, I wouldn't even be considered a fan if that's all I did, right? The, the idea is you have to follow them on Twitter uh, follow them on you know whatever sites they're on, and part of uh, being that part of uh, keeping that celebrity presence is this back and forth with their fan base. It's a lot closer. Uh, there's a lot more engagement, I, I suppose, with this. And uh, we had a student named Berlin who did her master's thesis on this very topic, uh, talking about Taylor Swift and how really Taylor Swift. If you want to understand what Taylor Swift, who she is, what, what she's all about as a celebrity, you know, it's, it's so much more than the music. Really, the music might only be a small part of it. You know, a lot more of it has to do with this sort of drama uh, that takes place amongst the fans, amongst uh, uh, Taylor Swift and her fellow uh, celebrities and the sort of back and forth on Twitter and all this. You know, I don't claim to understand the full ramifications of all this, but there's certainly a different kind of engagement that fans of Taylor Swift have with her uh, than I ever did with any of the music I grew up listening to. All right, moving on into uh, this idea of crowdsourcing. And if you're not familiar with this term, uh, a quick example would be Wikipedia. So before Wikipedia came about, the, if you're thinking about, I want to make an online encyclopedia. And there were some online encyclopedias. They started off actually on discs, CD-ROMs, if you're old enough to remember this. <laughs> uh, and of course, those were not written by everyday people. These were, uh, they, they paid professional editors to collect and write the, uh, the articles for those. And if you read about Wikipedia, the history of it, there was a split between the two people that founded the, or you know, wanted to found Wikipedia. I think there was a Newpedia that forked off or split off, and they did want to have paid editors to write the, uh, you know, write the uh, articles. But the other team, uh, Jimmy Wells and company, said, let's just, you know, put this out there. Let anybody in the world that wants to come in, edit the articles. Yeah, we'll have some wackos, sure, vandals, crazy <laughs> comments, whatever. Uh, but we think we're just going to experiment with this. We're just kind of going to, again, renegades. <laughs> this will be renegades. <laughs> and just put this out there and just see what happens. And, you know, lo and behold, it seemed to work out pretty well. You know, nobody even knows what Newpedia, you probably never even heard that before, uh, whereas Wikipedia is internationally uh, famous. And yes, it's got its problems, but, and, you know, that's a great example, though, of the crowdsourcing, because instead of just going to, you know, paid editors or doing it yourself, you just kind of open this up, let the whole crowd, in this case, real, you know, all the people on the Internet or anybody using Wikipedia uh, play a role in this. Uh, so that, that's pretty cool. And she says here, traditional marketing and branding focus. Traditional marketing and branding focus on telling customers what they need. Uh, today's audiences, however, are on the market and dictate the expectations and the tool they offer is crowdsourcing. Uh, so th that makes sense if you think about Wikipedia and how the, I remember the teachers used to tell me, or the teachers I was working with would say that they don't they, they don't allow <laughs> their students to use Wikipedia. <laughs> I don't know if you could even prevent that uh, these days, but it kind of turned out okay because a lot of the Wikipedia uh, editors had you know relatively high expectations, and a lot of those Wikipedia articles are actually more detailed than what you might find in a regular encyclopedia. Uh, but really, 
I think where I notice this most is with crowdfunding. If you work with a Kickstarter campaign, if you, uh, or even like the politics, you hear about these uh, small donation, these small donors all the time. Uh, that's kind of like crowdfunding. You know, so the idea is instead of going to like big monolithic companies or, you know, millionaires and getting these huge lump sums uh, to buy t television commercials, basically, uh, instead of that, you're going to the crowds and saying, you know, if everybody just puts in a dollar, a couple bucks, you know, we could make this thing happen. Uh, but the flip side of that is since you're not going to a publisher anymore, you're going directly to your fan base or your users, uh, they want to have a little bit of control over this. You know, if you want my money to make this thing, then I want to have some leverage in what gets made. A great example of this is the game, I think it was, a, yeah, Torment Tides of Numenera. So they did the Kickstarter campaign, raised a bunch of money, uh, but then they were trying to decide. They had never really worked out whether this game would have real-time combat, basically be more like action, uh, or a turn-based combat, which would be more strategic. So they actually went to the the fans or the uh, the people who had pledged money and put it to a vote. So, you know, what do you want? And the of course the fan the people who had pitched to make this game felt like they had that right. The problem was it came out like 50-50. <laughs> so all the developers were like, oh, no. You know, now we're going to like, no matter what we do, we're going to make half the audience uh, mad. Uh, so that's the flip side of this. You know, that's something to think about. You know, it's not all good. You, you do have to cede some control. And you might run into that situation where you've got a, <laughs> like a 50-50 split. And, you know, these are your fans, right? So you don't want them to be mad at you. It's one thing for a publisher to be mad at you. All right, moving on then, we got this concept of a thick skin. And, you know, this is kind of, kind of a thorny issue, I think. But, uh, you know, I almost wonder if she might sound a little flippant here. Uh, she says that innovation has always required a thick skin. Perhaps more so today with the tidal waves of commentary that always seem to follow a big idea. But if a few discouraging comments de derail you, uh, you may be better off staying inside those cubicle walls. Uh, so it sounds, you know, like I say to me, I don't know if I quite like the tone of this. You know, I don't, I'll, I'll see what you think here in a minute. Uh, but it certainly is true, I think, that, you know, my experience doing a YouTube channel and before that blogging, I mean, I was just, it's always amazing how there's these people that come out of the woodwork and just really try to uh, take you down a peg. And some of these, you know, especially when you're new to it and you're getting a lot of, uh, and that's unfortunately seems to be where these, I call them trolls, seem to focus their energies. You know, they really try to look for somebody that's kind of fresh and doing new stuff and they try to attack them because I think that's where they, they probably realize on some, whether this is conscious whether they're conscious of this or what, but they think that's where I can do the most damage, you know, somebody who's insecure. You know, the same thing with teachers, right? If you're a new teacher, uh, there's the students that probably wouldn't say anything horrible uh, to an experienced teacher. They sense that you're new, and it's almost like, you know, they talk about dogs uh, smelling fear. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I don't know what, I'm not a psychologist. I don't understand these folks, uh, but it's certainly true no matter how good a job you do, uh, no matter how much work you put into your content, uh, somebody some it's sometimes going to post something, uh, not necessarily offensive in terms of uh, you know explicit, uh, but just something negative, something nasty, makes you feel bad, highly critical, and you know and the idea they might just challenge what you're saying, so you're you're wrong, <laughs> you know that people love to correct you on everything. So I think that's probably true. You know, if you're not prepared for that, if you're not, if you really just don't feel like I cannot, I don't want that. You know, I don't want to have to deal with that. Okay, you know, maybe this is not <laughs> for you. Uh, but I wouldn't say that's the same thing as putting up with, with abuse. Uh, so that's what brings me to my next question for you. Uh, so what do you think? Do you think developing a quote unquote thick skin or uh, just staying offline, is that the uh, only options? Or is that the best and only way to handle discouraging comments? Uh, or are, is there some other way? You know, or should we be working on other ways? Or what can we do about it, if anything? Just I'm kind of wondering what you think about this concept. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, and then she talks about social media, the term social media. So she doesn't really like the term, doesn't do us any favors. It's not media. It was not invented for markets and advertisers, and, and people don't welcome it. And I certainly think this is, this is true. Uh, I remember, I can remember when the internet, or when the World Wide Web was gaining prominence uh, back in the 90s, and how wacky people thought it was that a bottle of ketchup, you know, they'd pick up this bottle of ketchup and be looking at it and say, you know what, look at this, there's a website on this ketchup bottle. You know, what does Heinz need with a, with a website? <laughs> you know, and back then it was just, nowadays you're probably like, well, of course they want a website. Uh, but back then people were thinking this was just bizarre. It was crazy, ludicrous. And the reason for that was it was because the Internet was not, nobody ever thought of this uh, when they were designing this. If you go back and look at things like Gopher, uh, which was invented here in Minnesota, uh, those sort of older technologies, it was basically kind of like an online library you know, people are going to be sharing technical information. Uh, there's going to be uh, email, <laughs> but it was mostly academic and scientific uh, and military, actually, applications for it. Nobody really thought about this as a consumer, a place where you go buy things. Uh, that, that was something that came later. Uh, so it's kind of created a, a lot of flux. It wasn't really designed for this. And I like the idea, too, about people not welcoming it. You know, sometimes uh, I think kids might like, oh, TikTok, that sounds cool. You know, let me let me uh, go jump into that. And whereas some people that are like, you know, I just figured out YouTube or, you know, whatever. I don't want to have to learn this whole new thing. What is that? I don't even want to hear about it. <laughs> you know, take your TikTok somewhere else. <laughs> uh, it tends to be the attitude. It's like, oh, one more thing I have to learn about, right? All right, so that's enough of, the, uh, of Martin for now. Uh, moving on to Carol. Now, I really like the way he sets up this discussion here about how we'll be analyzing the technical and rhetorical possibilities of digital spaces. That's really why I wanted to get this book. You know, there's a lot of, I think the technical stuff, as important as it is, uh, if, if I'm trying to learn how to do something technical, whether that be YouTube or Unity, uh, WordPress, Twine, uh, whatever it is, I, I typically don't go to a book for that. <laughs> You know, by the time it's in a book, it's obsolete. You know, for that, I'd probably go to YouTube and look for uh, tutorial videos. You know, that's where I tend to get my technical education. It's not a bad strategy for you, by the way. Uh, next time you're trying to learn something technical, uh, try YouTube. Uh, but the rhetorical possibilities are something something else. You know, that does make sense, I think. That's, that's something that does make sense for a book. Because these principles will be basically the same. Uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, maybe even thousands of years, depending on how classical we want to go with, with the concepts. Uh, but there are intriguing things, if you think about rhetoric being, maybe from an Aristotelian perspective, as being about persuasion, you know, about strategies for strategic... <laughs> strategies for strategic? <laughs> if you think about strategies for effective communication, being persuasive, being effective... Uh, it, you know, it makes a lot of sense to incorporate things like interactivity. So it's one thing if you're up in front of a stage giving a speech. Uh, it's another thing if you're making a television commercial and people will be watching at home uh, or buying, designing an advertisement for a magazine, uh, things of that sort, writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper. Uh, all that is different if it's, if it's, if you take those, you know, how does those concepts that would work for that apply if it's an interactive thing where people can now you know, comments on it, uh, where you have to give people choices about A or B or C, you know, let them make choices as they, as they proceed through a narrative. Um, and what about uh, simulations? You know, how does that, is, do simulations and games have a persuasive uh, rhetorical dimension? Uh, and if so, what does that look like? You know, what about the user participation and user contributions? You know, these are all uh, relatively new unexplored territories and you know, I think the author might be I think Carol might play it up a little much and I don't think it was ever the case where you know communication was ever really passive completely uh, you know, there's always been a certain amount of interaction but it's certainly heightened uh, in this digital age so that's what kind of excites me about this semester I really want to get more into how we can apply uh, rhetorical principles to these new 
uh, platforms, the new social media platforms, and how they're how we need to adapt to accommodate their features. Uh, so then he talks about language being fluid, malleable, and negotiated. You know, this is something that we tend to forget. And actually, if you study the history of writing, which he talks a lot about uh, in this chapter, and it's a fascinating subject, just how do we, if you remember that game Civilization, <laughs> you know, that, there's that moment when you can, your civilization learns writing. That's a big deal, and you get <laughs> major benefits for that. Uh, but just in terms of language, it's interesting to see how societies, once they develop writing, uh, there's all this, all these side effects that go along with that. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But one of them is that the language, there tends to be this concept arising of correct language and correct, even like correct spelling uh, that just wasn't there before. And it tends to fix language. So you get these, these situations where, you know, the kids or the people are talking a certain way, but they always feel a little bit ashamed of the way they're talking. Like, I'm not speaking correctly. <laughs> and there's always that sort of anxiety about not being correct or, or being a substand non-standard or something. And the idea there is that's kind of a vestige. It's one of the side effects of uh, this literacy. If you didn't have writing, you wouldn't have that anxiety. You know, people would just be talking the way they talk. And if, you know, the language would just change, pronunciations would change. Uh, over time, uh, but something about a writing system tends to freeze that or at least slow it down. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. So he talks about new technologies in general, new communication technologies, redist redistributing labor, uh, but here's a claim. They can even influence how we think. And he gives the examples there of Plato and Aristotle. And if you want to I find this sort of stuff fascinating. <laughs> you know, if you're philosophy, if you're into philosophy, you should read Plato's uh, Gorgias, 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 looks like a G O R G I A S. And he's also got a wonderful dialogue called the Phaedrus. Uh, and some of those parts of those dialogues talk about the invention of uh, writing and what is it, you know, how does uh, writing and speaking compare, which is better. Uh, for learning and so on. And Plato does talk in there about how Plato wrote position. It's kind of hard to ferret out sometimes, uh, probably by design. Uh, remember, Plato's all about dialogues, not just uh, <laughs> giving you the answers. Uh, but, you know, it is a concern if you have people reading a book, and if there's something in that book they don't understand or they think is wrong, they can't really do much about it, right? You can't, the author's not there. You can't ask the author a question. Uh, you can't challenge the author. You, know, you could try to write another book, but you know, of course, that would take years. Uh, but there, even there, you think, well, Wikipedia would let you edit it. <laughs> so, you know, so I always wonder, well, like, what Plato would think about Wikipedia you know, when he's criticizing a, a books. But you know, other things like the memory. So I, I, I was really intrigued by this when Carroll was talking about the. Uh, in, in, in societies that don't have literacy, people have amazing memories. And they just memorize whole books. You know, and I know people that they know the Bible. Or they know the Quran. Every word. <laughs> they have the whole thing memorized. And they can just quote it to you. And it, it seems to be a skill that maybe is developed early on in their childhood. And you kind of lose it later. I don't know. But I, those same people that know, like, the Quran... Uh, word for word, they know like all this poetry. Just you know, you talk, you br you bring up a little line of a poem, like two paths diverged in a wood. You, you say something like that to them, and but they know the whole poem, <laughs> and they just kind of easily you know pick this up. Uh, whereas me, you know, I'm doing good to remember like the two roads, two paths diverged in a wood, but you know, because I, you know, I just never really needed to memorize stuff. Uh, so I think that's that's pretty cool. I think uh, Carol's definitely on to something, or Plato, I guess, was on to something there. It does seem to have some kind of impact on memory. You know, how many phone numbers do you know? Uh, I can remember my friend's phone numbers from back when I was a kid, because <laughs> we had the, you know, the old dial. We had the. Well, I do seem to remember some phones with the rotary dials, but you had to remember the number to uh, call your friend, uh, whereas now that's just saved for you on your phone, right? So there's no need for you to actually memorize 
the number. Some people don't even know their own phone number. <laughs> they just have to look it up every time. Uh, so, so that's just kind of fun to think about. Uh, of course, Aristotle had a different a different interpretation of this, different uh, arguments about writing. And of course, he wrote a whole book on rhetoric. Yeah, just, just kind of saw it as a tool that could be used uh, for good or ill. Of course, there is some debate. Carol doesn't mention this, but there is debate about whether Aristotle actually wrote anything, or at least uh, wrote the stuff we have from him. The, the debate is maybe it was just his students sitting in those lectures and taking notes, basically making these Cliff's notes, uh, crib notes, whatever you want to call them. Maybe that's not actually Aristotle's prose. Uh, so that's the question. But, but anyway, uh, moving on. So I'm just, just for fun, wanted to ask you, how do you think your life would be like? Or how do you think your life would be different if you lived in one of those societies that didn't have writing? Uh, so if there was no writing, if you didn't know how to read, no, nobody knew how to read, nobody knew how to write, uh, just what would your day-to-day -day life be? How would that be different? All right, so then Carol gives us a set of attributes for communication technologies. And I like these kind of, or these attributes because we could sort of apply them to whatever the medium is, whether it's a book or a website, or whether it's Wikipedia, or whether it's a regular book versus a choose your own adventure book, a game, you know, you name it. And you can get in here and start thinking about how these uh, attributes, you know, how would you describe the attributes in those cases? Like, you know, the fixity. So is this something that changes a lot over time? Is it dynamic uh, or is it static? So we think about sh a Shakespeare play. Uh, when those plays were being uh, performed, they were very fluid, very dynamic. You know, they were changing things from night to night. See how <laughs> Shakespeare, I guess, you know, if something didn't work, he would just change it. Uh, and then there would be different versions of the plays out there, different manuscripts. And when they started to publish these things, you know, there'd be discrepancies amongst the versions. Uh, but gradually it kind of fixed, it became fixed, you know, rightly or wrongly. And now we feel like, well, that's Hamlet, you know, or that, that's uh, Mac Macbeth. Uh, and so over time they became uh, fixed, but at the beginning they were uh, more dynamic. And that's probably true for a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, once you have a million copies of it out there, uh, it's really easy to see that's the authoritative uh, version right there. You know, the same thing with the, the printing press, right? Carol talks about this. And if you know about how they would, before the printing press, they would just have to copy things out by hand. They're scribes. And the scribes were always making mistakes. Uh, no matter how careful they tried to be, there'd always be these like missing words or misspelling or a wrong word or repeated thing. Uh, but you know, once the printing press started churning out these things by the thousands, then you had a lot better chance of having, uh, you know, at least an agreed upon version, it became fixed. Uh, discreteness, so is this just part of a, you know, big thing, sort of a networked, uh, part of a structure, uh, or is it self-contained? So we think about a book having a front and a back, you know, there it is, it's one unit, uh, versus if you think about some of the network stuff and maybe like a Facebook page, it just seems, doesn't seem quite as discreet, right? It's, it kind of bleeds into everything else. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think it's, if you're on the internet reading, it's so easy to get off task and go read something else uh, because it's all this stuff all around. It's not really a discreet thing like a magazine article or a book. Uh, that's one reason I still like to read books uh, because you don't, you're not always distracted by pop-ups and all this other stuff happening. You know, it's a very uh, self-contained medium. Uh, the division of labor, he talks there about authors and readers. You know, you read, you write, and you're not doing both. Uh, whereas some of these newer forms, like Wikipedia, I would say, yeah, you're reading it, but, you know, you could just click a button, edit. Now you're editing it. So it kind of breaks down this division of labor. Uh, the primacy for creativity and originality. This is one of the more interesting ones. I haven't seen this mentioned as often. But maybe there's something about a book that does privilege uh, sort of an author function, as a Foucault would put it. Uh, the, the idea that it needs to be something original, that plagiarism becomes a thing, to be uh, avoided at all costs, right? Copyright infringement. 
you know, all of this stuff becomes a big deal uh, for the books, book printing. And some of that has to do basically with capitalism, right? And just the trying to make a living as a publisher, as, as an author. Uh, but again, if you look at Wikipedia, uh, a lot of the times you don't really see like who worked on this page. Who, it does, they don't really have an author. Uh, you know, it might be several people if you go into the discussions and you can see who made the edits. But, you know, people don't edit Wikipedia because they want to have their name on the page, right? Uh, whereas that, if they're, if you're, I was writing a journal article, <laughs> it's kind of important. I want my name on the article. Uh, so that, that's, I think this, this, this one here about the creativity, I think it's really interesting. I want to keep coming back to that. Uh, and then finally, the uh, linearity. This kind of ties into that idea of being interactive. So linear just means like a line. You, know, you start at the beginning, you work your way through uh, point A to point B. And the idea is with the book, you probably start at the beginning and, you know, work your way through to the end. You're probably not skipping all around the book. Again, if it's a choose your own adventure book, they'll say, well, if you want to do this, turn to page 12. <laughs> if you want to do that, turn to page 50. So it's not really linear. Uh, and of course, uh, something like a website, you know, you might start at the beginning and work your way down, but you might also just say, you know, I'm just going to skip this, click here first. Now I'm going to go back and click that. Uh, so the medium allows or doesn't allow uh, for that kind of uh, uh, linearity. All right, now we get into some principles of good writing. We could certainly talk about this, whether we agree <laughs> that these are indeed the principles of good writing. And it's kind of a, uh, Carol is following a venerable tradition, you know, especially if you have studied journalism, uh, this, this idea of being clear, this idea of being brief, and he even quotes, uh, references uh, Strunk in white. <laughs> He's either famous or infamous, depending on your perspective. You know, we can always, uh, you know, challenge these things, but I, I think in general it is good at least to know uh, where the, you know, what most people would consider to be good writing. You know, as they say, know the rules before you break the rules, you know, I think makes uh, sense here. Uh, but we can, uh, I guess some exercises here that I took from the book that we can do quickly. I think they'll be fun. Uh, but they will follow these basic principles. So just, if it's social media, if it's going to be a Twitter, you know, the Twitter feed's probably the most important place for the brevity. Uh, but even a blog, uh, even an email, you know, the idea being that we get so much information. You know, we're not living in an age where when you got, it was so rare uh, to get something to read, right? And you, your friends would write you a letter and it might take weeks to get to you. So you write like uh, four or five pages in the letter and you're happy to spend the time reading that. I mean, no, we're not in this age anymore. You know, matter of fact, sometimes I get a text and I'm like, man, that is a long text. Why do you send me such a long text? Can't you be brief? <laughs> you know, much less an email. Like, just get to the point. You know, I've got like 50 of these things I have to get to today. Uh, so that does seem to be a concern. Like, how can you respect, I think about it this way, respecting somebody's time, uh, not just being going on and on about something. How do I keep a lecture brief, you know, so I don't bore you? Um, precision, and you know, that's pretty uh, self-evident. I think everybody can agree on that one. Uh, it needs to be precise. You need to say, it needs to mean what you are trying to make it mean. You don't want miscommunication. Uh, active, so keeping things moving along, using action, kind of ties into this idea of being imaginative, uh, something fresh, something evocative, uh, will certainly uh, be a lot more entertaining, a lot more engaging, <laughs> yeah, colorful. Uh, being direct, uh, this is something we're not really used to with academic writing. You know, we're like, don't use you, uh, don't speak directly to the reader. You know, there's all those sorts of uh, maxims out there where it just doesn't really apply. And I always think it's it's really fun, and I encourage you to do this if you have some, you know, when you read an academic article and you think, wow, this is very dry, this is very formal. Uh, I bet if you look for that, that scholar on Twitter or Facebook and you look at their Twitter feed, uh, they might be talking about the same stuff in a very different fashion. You know, there they will be being brief and direct and a lot more imaginative, maybe. So it's not a question of them not being able to do it. It's just 
the different uh, formats. So they sort of recognize that writing a tweet or a blog calls for a different skill set or a different set of principles than writing for that uh, textbook or that, uh, that journal. Uh, being consistent, especially with the parallelism, and, and then being aware uh, of what you're doing, being mindful of the audience, avoiding stereotypes, uh, avoiding uh, generalizations, and so on. So here's just a question for fun. So what about this idea of plain English? You know, Carol says we should. this basically is what we should all aspire to, is just being clear, being plain, uh, just getting the point made. So is that something we should all aspire to? Or is it just a myth? <laughs> Maybe this whole concept is flawed. So I just throw that out there. Uh, tell me what you think. All right, now we're going to skip into some quick exercises. And again, I, I want to just keep this quick. Don't put a whole lot of time into it. Uh, but it is important to try to apply uh, these principles right away. Test yourself to see if you understand the, the point. Maybe have some fun with it. Uh, so in this first example, we're just rewriting the sentence to convey the same meaning in fewer words. So again, brevity being shorter. Uh, the little joke here is that these are famous phrases or famous quotes. So see if you can recognize what it's riffing on, and then you could put the, uh, the original quotation in there. And as you're doing that, you could think, well, maybe that's why that quote became a quote, right? Because it is so well worded. It's so brief. It, you know, so few words contain so much meaning. Uh, so anyway, here's the, uh, the exercise. And I put the page numbers here if you want to look at the other examples. If you, uh, you know, depending on how long it has been since you've read it. Uh, anyway, uh, people should not succumb to a fear of anything except being fearful in the first place. And we should stick together on this so we can't be defeated. So my guess is you probably recognize that <laughs> quote. Uh, go ahead and type it in. All right, here we have brevity exercise 1.2, which is another one of my favorites. This is a great one for creative writing. Uh, but the idea is to write a short story in just six words. And the Ernest Hemingway's one about the baby shoes is on page 24. That's probably the most famous of these. Uh, but he gives some other examples. I thought this was fun. I hadn't seen this before. Uh, this is by William Shatner, who uh, played Captain Kirk on Star Trek. And he wrote one of these, which I thought was kind of fun. Anyway, it's a failed SAT, lost scholarship, invented rocket. <laughs> That's Shatner's efforts. So see if you can uh, do one at least as good as uh, Shatner's. Let uh, me just have some fun with it. You know, just six words. Uh, can you come up with a short story in just six words? All right, now we're getting into precision and I think also some good teaching tools. And you know, we talk about when I was in school, they talked about context clues. So if you don't know what a word means, you know, study how it's used in the sen sentence. And sometimes you can pick up on uh, the definition that way without having to go to a dictionary. So that's basically what you're trying to do here is provide context clues and to help people understand the, in this case, not just one word, but two words that sound alike, but actually mean different things. So the example is deduce and infer. So we, he gives us two sentences, one about deduce. Uh, from the blood on the single glove, he deduced that the murder was left handed. So when we look at this, we could sort of figure out what the word deduced means by looking at this rest of the sentence. Uh, same thing with infer. Uh, by leaving her bloodstained glove on the table, she inferred her guilt. And then kind of look at these this pair of sentences and figure out what's the difference between deduction and inference. Uh, so with that in mind, see if you can do something similar. You don't have to do both of these. Uh, just pick one. Or if you want to do both, that's fine. Uh, or both sets, I should say. But disinterested and uninterested. And allusion with the A, illusion, and then illusion with the I or illusion. And so nobody says allusion. You, know, you just kind of say it all, it all sounds the same, illusion, illusion, illusion. Uh, so you, can't, you don't necessarily hear the difference when somebody's speaking, but they actually mean different things in all these uh, sets. So see if you can write some sentences that uh, bring out that difference, make it clear. All 
and now we're talking about more active sentences. And the problem with the, the other thing is a passive sentence, right? Where you're saying things like the, the book was read, uh, the, the grass was mowed. So those are passive sentences. It's very popular style in science writing because they don't want to make these active sentences because it's, especially in science, it's not supposed to matter who did the experiment. All that matters is what was done, right? They want to take the people out of it because that might even bias the results, right? If you think, well, this is a famous scientist, so-and-so, and so I should, I should care what they uh, say. No, you should only be looking at the method and the results. It shouldn't matter who did it. Uh, but other than that context, it usually is better to, we want, we want to be clear, like who is doing it, what's happening. You know, we want action. We want to see things. We want to experience things. We don't want to just be lulled into a <laughs> deep slumber <laughs> uh, when we're reading something. Uh, so here's some examples. And so take one of these sentences. It's got a lot of passive, not a lot of action. And see if you can rewrite it to make it more active and more descriptive while you're at it. So here's the two examples. One of them is the, the labor leaders were frustrated by the latest offer, which forced them to go through with the strike. And then the second one is, she walked into the room without saying a word, sat down, and looked at me. So see, just see if you can take those, one, either one of those you like, see if you can make it more active and more descriptive. Now this imaginative exercise is sort of playing around with the cliches and analogies and metaphors. And one of the uh, authors I like to read on writing is a uh, creative writing author where he writes about creative writing, how to write novels. Uh, Bell, I think his name is James Scott Bell. Uh, but he talks about this in a different way. Uh, so his advice is as you're writing, you know, go ahead and use cliches. Just use the cliches uh, as you're drafting uh, because you just need to sort of get, get it down and move on. And then later when you're editing, then you can go back and you can you can spot those cliches again. You go back to those and make them fresher, you know, make them more uh, relevant to your theme and your book. Uh, but don't get too hung up on it, you know, trying to be uh, fresh and <laughs> brilliant uh, as you're drafting because you'll never get anything done. Uh, but I think this exercise could still be uh, fun for us. So the idea is you take a technological innovation of your choice in two sentences, each using a different analogy and each with a different emphasis in meaning. Uh, so we'd be taking something like the internet or TikTok or <laughs> YouTube or whatever, and then you're trying to say it's, it's like something else. And whatever it is that you're comparing it to needs to uh, somehow shed some light, illuminate some aspect of it. And then you'll find another analogy or metaphor right after that that sort of subtly uh, alters that focus. So here's just one example. As an information superhighway, the internet too often resembles a Los Angeles cloverleaf during rush hour. <laughs> so, you know, I like this because he, he takes this cliche about information superhighway and then sort of does something interesting with it, sort of, uh, uh, you know, makes us think about that in a different, different way. You know, as a Los Angeles cloverleaf during rush hour. Uh, so that's pretty clever. See if you can come up with something like that. Uh, this is an easy one about consistency, you know, and I'm sure if you're a teacher, you see this in your student writing all the time. And uh, The idea is if you have a, especially a longer sentence or a sentence that's going to have a list of things, a list of items, a series, uh, then you want that those items to match grammatically, syntactically. And you want it basically to fit the same form uh, so that it's easier to remember, rolls off the tongue. And this is a good example, by the way, of when reading out loud is essential because you can really hear like the piece that doesn't fit. Uh, so what we want to do is just find the bit that's a little bit wonky, a little awkward, make it fit the rest. So Delta Airlines, Delta Airlines promises a bounty of international flights that are on time, have convenient connections, and offer a well-balanced in-flight meal. <laughs> so I tried, I tried to kind of ham it up a little bit so you could hear the, the piece that's a little awkward in the mouth. Uh, so see if you can fi make, uh, fix that. And then he goes over, he's got several lists here, 
Uh, a lot of good advice, actually. Uh, you can, I think he at one point starts just referring to Ten Commandments of Writing or something, like he's writing a Bible. Uh, but we do have certain aspects, and I like the way he sort of breaks these down. And we could spend a lot of time on these. I really won't do this here, uh, other than just to refer you to his uh, to his list. Hopefully, we'll be applying these throughout the semester. But you know, I don't know to what extent it would be, be <laughs> useful for you for me to just go over uh, what he's saying. Uh, the stereotyping and generalizing, those are some of the more important ones, I think, uh, for our perspective, just because it is so easy to slip into uh, generalizations, especially. You know, most of us can recognize a stereotype and say, well, you shouldn't do that. You know, that's usually pretty clear. Uh, but the generalizing, it's a little easier, I think, for people, even like the most, uh, it always astounds me, even people who are, for lack of a better word, woke, <laughs> like super woke people, uh, and they, they, they would recognize a stereotype, you know, from a light year away. Uh, and yet they'll still be just generalizing all over the place. You know, the, the American people, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, men, blah, blah, blah. You know, I guess that kind of fits into to stereotyping there. But, uh, you know, the idea being you don't want to, uh, if you, know, you can slip into inaccuracy pretty easy if you're trying to put everybody of a certain group into one category, make it out like they're all the same. Uh, plagiarizing, you know, that's uh, goes beyond just cheating and into issues of uh, proper citation and how to quote things properly. Now, oversimplifying, I kind of put that in with generalize, generalizing. Uh, jumping to conclusions and applying faulty logic or circular arguments. Uh, these are ones that are probably familiar if you've ever taken any kind of logic class or you probably got into this if you took English 191. You know, it's, it's about evidence-based reasoning and being able to uh, break down your argument and see what am I claiming or what's my argument and, and what kind of evidence am I bringing to bear on this? Does the evidence match up with the the, uh, the argument? Does it actually prove what it is? I think I'm trying to prove. Uh, so that certainly warrants a closer look. And then the uh, overusing pronouns and articles is another one I notice a lot in uh, student writing. Uh, this tendency just to say this, you know, blah, 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 this shows you're like, well, what is the this there? It's kind of vague. Uh, so I definitely see that a lot. Now, he also talks about some ways to kind of get the creative juices flowing, which I thought was useful. Uh, he talks about storyboarding, but I kind of like the idea of uh, cork boarding uh, instead. That's what I've been really using a lot lately. Uh, so here's a couple, couple tools to show you what this looks like. This Scrivener, if you haven't heard of Scrivener, this is basically becoming the, basically what, what Adobe Photoshop is to graphic designers and artists. Uh, Scrivener is becoming that for novelists and short story writers and poets. And I would, I think too, maybe students working on essays. Uh, the thing I love about it is how it separates out the, your notes. Um, you, can, you see how it kind of separates these into cards you can put out on this sort of corkboard. And then you can flip back and forth between your manuscript and these cards. And it really makes it easy uh, to stay uh, organized, not to lose your thoughts. Uh, to me, it just kind of helps me to write and stay, uh, you know, not get distracted. And I don't want to act, act, <laughs> have to actually drag out note cards. Uh, but once you have these cards, then you can shuffle them around. You know, you can move it, uh, move them where you want it. Works out pretty well. You know, think about writing a paper and having a lot of sources and quotes. You know, each one of these cards could be one of your quotes. You could just put them, fill up your corkboard, and then as you're writing, you could figure out, well, this goes over in this section, this one more, more applies here, and so on and so forth. Uh, Trello is really more about, uh, this is used a lot in a software design. If you have a big team of people, you see it's collaborative. Scrivener is just for one person, just for you and your home computer or your laptop, uh, whereas Trello is a collaborative thing where you can invite people in. But it's similar with the cards. So you, you create a, a column there. You might, I usually say something like urgent and then less urgent or this week, next week, or this month or this year. You just kind of way to prioritize task I need to work on. And then you just put in the cards and then you can just easily click and drag it. So they've got these done categories. 
So you like you wake up in the morning, you make your list of things to do, and then as you're doing them, you just swap it over there, throw it into the done stack, and that's uh, strangely satisfying. You know, it feels tactile. <laughs> you feel like you're getting stuff done this way, and I like the way too because sometimes uh, when you're writing, especially, uh, suddenly you have an idea, but instead you don't want to go pursue it right now because then you'll get off task, get distracted. Uh, so when that happens, I'll open up Trello quick, type in the idea, and then just jump back into my uh, into my writing. But it's there, you know, so later I can go back and, and find it again. It's a really helpful tool. Oh. And then he talks about some writing myths. He says, a writer's block is just a myth. <laughs> just a, sort of an excuse people came up with not to do their work, I suppose. You know, that's, that's certainly true. I don't. You know, I don't know if I've ever been inspired. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to get the job done, right? You know, what's that quote about, uh, I only write when I'm inspired, and I make damn sure I'm inspired every morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, another myth is idea of the first draft being all that you need. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, I think, students, they, they come to us with such such varying skill levels that, a lot of times we tend to get focused on one group or the other. And a lot of the groups, a lot of the, the students who can write decently, you know, they're not bad writers, but they feel like they're just way better than they are because, they're, again, the, you know, there's different tiers, I guess, or different levels that they're at in terms of writing. And so they tend to just coast by. And nobody's ever really uh, nailed them, <laughs> for lack of a better word, uh, on their drafting. They've never been sort of taken to that next level. And they just feel like, well, it's okay. You know, I'm, I've been doing fine all this time. I've been making A's in all my English classes and just doing a draft, first draft. I do very little editing. And so they get this really false sense of confidence. You know, it's sort of like the being, a, you know, playing basketball or something in, in PE. <laughs> you know, you feel like I'm a pretty good basketball player, you know. Uh, but then... Now you're trying to play with professionals or you're now you're in there on the, the varsity team or something and you find out, man, I'm really, I'm not even close to being good. <laughs> you know, I find that with writing in uh, college and I was students, you know, there's, there's like good for an English 191 class. <laughs> uh, that's a very different type of good uh, than being good uh, with professional writers or if you go to conferences and uh, you know, so basically what I'm saying is if you think, well, I just need one draft will be fine, uh, you, then you're kind of playing in that minor league, you know, amateur hour. <laughs> if you, <laughs> you know, all the professionals know it's going to take a lot more than just one draft. You know, this might take many, many drafts to get it to where you need it to be. Uh, I'm a multitasker. This is another big one. I see students all the time, you know, and they think, I'm a multitasker. I'm a digital native. Oh, ha, ha, I, I'm going to have Pandora. I'm going to have YouTube. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have Facebook open. I'm going to have my uh, Twitter thing open. And it's like somehow you're still going to focus. You know, I get even students watching these uh, PowerPoints I do. You know, I'm sure they're like trying to do three or four different things as they're watching, quote unquote. And then they miss stuff. They have to go back. And, you know, it's just not a good idea. You know, I always just say, sit down. Do the thing and then do the next thing. Uh, you don't want a bunch of music playing, a bunch of stuff uh, happening all around you. You know, that's one reason why I'm just like Carol, by the way. You know, I wake up in the morning, I try to get my writing done. I don't play music. I don't watch YouTube in the background. <laughs> just, just get it done. <laughs> it's much more efficient. You know, I even see people go into the gym sometimes, and you just laugh. I laugh at these folks. I mean, really. I mean, you're there to exercise, uh, but they have a TV going, and then they have their phone, and they're listening to music, and then they're trying to read a magazine. I'm like, what are you even doing? You know, you'd be better off just coming in here and spending like 20 minutes just really focused on an exercise, you know, really just giving your full attention to the uh, the exercise. Uh, then if you spent like hours in here with all that other, other stuff distracting you, you're not getting a good uh, workout that way. Uh, same thing with uh, writing. Better to do just half an hour of really focused writing uh, than hours of just sort of half, <laughs> half-assed writing uh, with all this other stuff going on. Uh, and then finally, writing is a chore. 
you know, this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you're dreading it, of course, you're not going to enjoy it. Uh, if you try to see this as something great, something fun, again, I think Carol's right on the money. I do the same thing. You really want to take some time every now and then to fantasize. Like, what if I wrote the best thing? You know, what if this PowerPoint was just magnificent? Everybody loved it. You know, what would be the payoff of that? I mean, what would be the rewards of that? And just kind of like revel in that uh, that place for a while mentally because it's really pleasant to be. You know, I've even heard coaches tell people, you know, visualize, you know, visualize the ball going into the net. You know, and you think, that's silly. What good does that do? Uh, but it helps. You know, somehow it, it helps. Again, we don't necessarily understand why <laughs> this stuff matters. <laughs> uh, but there is something about, you know, having that goal and, and really feeling like it's something I can do. Right? I can do this. I can turn out a great paper. Uh, I can really, you know, knock the professor's socks off with my writing. And, you know, that can help you to actually reach the goal. Uh, whereas if you're like, oh, no, man, I don't want to go to the gym today. I have stressed out. Uh, I don't, you know, even this, I'm not making any progress. You know, you can sort of talk yourself into doing a poor job. Uh, so it's important, I think, to monitor that self-talk, try to uh, correct it. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, here's where he's talking about the, uh, the generalizing and the uh, stereotyping. So avoiding those ethnocentric references, such as we, our, or us, or our country, the reference assume too much, and they communicate exclusi exclusivity. So he talks there about, you know, if you're just saying things like we, uh, uh, the Americans, American people, blah, blah, blah. So imagine listening to something like that as an immigrant or as an international student. Or, you know, you can, I'm sure you can think of many other examples of this where you've heard somebody use some type of reference and you're like, well, does that include me? Am I not included in that? You know, it just makes you feel uh, strange or maybe even alienated from it. And it's probably not, you know, if that's, that's probably not what they meant to do, uh, but nevertheless, that's the effect that it had, that, that language. So trying to be precise about the proper noun for the population or group, you know, so instead of just saying all the time, in today's society, blah, blah, blah. Whose society? I mean, is society just this monolithic thing that is just one of <laughs> and that we all belong to? Uh, you know, I always, I, I hate it when these talking heads on TV, they just talk, talk, well, the American people want this. And I'm thinking, I don't want that. Does that mean I'm not an American person? <laughs> you know, it's kind of silly. They probably made something like uh, the, you know, maybe conservatives want this or even that term, you, know, you could probably get in there and say, well, think about all the different conservatives, <laughs> all the different liberals. <laughs> uh, so the idea, again, is try to come away from the stereotypes, come away from the generalizations, see if you can be more specific about the people that you're, you're talking about. Uh, orphan quotes, you know, this is something I see even in graduate writing, to be uh, honest with you. And the same thing with the number 10, relying too much on quoted material. So what happens is you're reading, you're not really confident you understand what it is you're reading, uh, or you certainly don't feel confident trying to paraphrase it. So you just tend to just dump it in, and then you don't really set it up. You don't really introduce it. Uh, and then you don't really do anything with it. You don't explain, like, why is it here? <laughs> so I kind of see it as letting somebody else do your writing for you or letting somebody else make your points. And I always say you should use quotes to support your points not make your points. <laughs> and so you can uh, quote me on that. And so part of that is you don't just dump in a quote without anything around it, just have it like standing on its own. Uh, instead, you need to do something with it. All right, that'll do for now. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I want you to ask a question about the material or make a comment about the lecture. I always appreciate that reading those, it gives me some feedback, All right? So I have to ask the right questions and then study the common answers, which I will do. Uh, but anyway, I will go for now and see you next time.